Well, good afternoon in Europe and good morning to all of our colleagues joining us today from the US and more westerly locations. Uh, we're delighted to host this webinar today on the Global Peril 2023. What are the trends we're seeing now in the second half of this year? And obviously, recession is a top topic. So how ready do we need to be as a Global Peril team and function and some of the different uh, topics that we see surfacing on that? And um, today I'm joined on the fireside chat by my good colleagues, Mary Holland, Chief Customer Officer in Payslip, and Daniela Barbova, who's Head of Product in Payslip. And so what we wanted to do today was have a fireside chat across the three of us, uh, uh, reflecting on what we saw some of the trends for 2022, um, talk about you know, what, how we have seen those trends manifest across our different clients and in the market generally, and maybe some of the also payslip innovations that we've implemented in the product that have been used by our customers to deal with those. We also see some new um, objectives across the market uh, feeding into 2023 as things have changed fundamentally this year, both from this time last year when everybody was talking about talent wars now to like recession readiness and then what we have on some of the pace of roadmap for next year that would be of interest that will help prepare for that so that that's our plan for this afternoon uh it'll be one hour long we welcome you to and in, we invite you to put any questions and uh into the chat function and we will come to those in due time We'll also have a few polls like this one during the session today just to get a little bit of feedback from you on certain core questions. And I suppose just to uh, look at that poll and, and jump into that, uh, I've actually just lost the poll results there. Um, sorry, could we put the poll results back up, Michelle? No, I'm too late on the poll. We might have to flash back <laughs> to those in a second, so my apologies. Okay. Oh, here we go. There Thanks very much. Yeah. So the question was, what is your biggest priority for multi-country payroll management in 2023? And um, there were four options, the fourth one being very generic. So we see that over a third of participants have said automated and standardized processes across countries. Well, that's that's always music to our ears in PACEP because we help deliver standardization uh, for global payroll management. Um, then we followed up by a 13% simplicity, finding a solution to all the complexity. So absolutely, payroll will always be complex because it's locally defined and every country will vary. So trying to find a level at, at the global level uh, that is actually uh, possible to simplify is, is a key objective. So that feeds probably into the automation and standardization objective as well. And then a global management strategy covering all workforce comes in on its own at a lower 7%. And then we've nearly half the people saying, well, actually, we need to achieve all of those three things. So that's very interesting. And, and on all the workforce part, we've definitely seen changes over the last few years where um, it's, it's clear that it's a very normal workforce model to have core employees, contractors, employees of records, as well as expats. And now they're finally being looked at in terms of managed as a full workforce. So in terms of like kicking into like what, what did we see as a highlight for that? Well, for across those different trends in terms of what's happening, sorry, in the market over the year. Um, is that myself, Mary, or is it? I keep hearing it. Sorry. No, we can um, we it's can my, hear you, Fadama. It's my headpiece. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, on the standardization topic that we see leading across that poll, like one of the biggest um, uh, drivers I saw over the years when I was founding Pace, well over six years ago, was I asked many companies in the market how they manage payroll globally and how standardized it is, and very often. Uh, there were many companies that were um, trying to find standardization by centralizing their contract into, into one main provider. And then, of course, like one of the largest providers in the market is ADP. And so what we saw ADP do with, back in the 1990s, it, it is actually over 30 years old, was they developed a, 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 an input format called a flexi form. And that flexi form is specific in each country to the payroll provider that they have on their ADP streamline uh, solution. Um, and so when in Payslip, when we meet our customers and they have a range of vendors, it's not unusual that they may have ADP in, in, in several countries because they are the, the they have been the leader in the market over the years. 
But what we see is that these ADP customers have faced a lot of tedious hours of manual entry, taking the data down sheets from um, their SOAR systems and bringing it across into this flexi form in a very manual way. Uh, and a payslip, what we did this year, which is a, a massive innovation, I, I would think, and our customers agree with us, is actually that we built the FlexiForm Automator, which can take all of the data inputs and automatically produce these FlexiForms across. So, Mary, I know you've worked with like lots of different customers on the rollout of this. Um, what exactly did you see as the challenges that they were trying to meet in, in using the FlexiForms and how useful is a, an automation tool to help standardize how those FlexiForms are produced for them? Well, Fidelma, I think, first of all, it liberated the ability for the clients to be able to get away from having to do manual data into these flexi forms. Now, we know the, the reason is because they have multiple um, in-country providers that have special requirements for the particular country, but each one is different with different requirements. So it eliminated all this manual work of preparing those forms. Also, someone double checking those and it automated the entire process so that those forms are automatically um, ingested, the information is ingested into our system, and then the flexi forms are automatically created. So we know exactly what's happened. We have good audit controls on that. Saves tremendous amount of time. If you think about somebody with 20 countries and they're spending maybe a day to get those ready, and over an entire year, you could be spending hours maybe in over 2000, maybe in actually a whole person's work hours for the whole year, 20, 80 hours, just spending on flexi forms if you have 20 different countries there. So we really actually gave them the ability to be more strategic and look at the data and then they know exactly what's brought over so they can do better comparisons when, which we'll be sharing more in, um, insights to that later in the webinar. Okay, fantastic. That's a, that's a pretty shocking amount of hours to have uh, saved a full uh, person year across the whole year. So I'm sure you're actually one of their favorite people on, on the calls when you're telling them that, that that's up and, up and working. Um, and, and Daniela, like on the whole topic of automation, really that's what we're trying to do here is we're trying to automate the pre-payroll for all the data to be collated and, and moved across into the payroll providers. And then, and then it moves across and the providers are also running their calculations. And that's unique in every country because we know payroll is local. They're using different payroll engines. And then they have to send the gross to nets back into the uh, payroll function. So what kind of automation is possible for the GTNs and what can companies expect uh, to achieve if they start trying to automate some of their GTN uh, management? Yeah, thank you, Fidelma. So indeed, uh, we at Payslip are trying to provide end-to-end -end integration and automation solutions, and this is throughout the whole process. As you mentioned already, ADP FlexiForm on pre-payroll, then automations, integrations on payroll step and post-payroll step, so it's really great. Uh, the cross to net one, the one that you mentioned, is actually the one related on the payroll steps, and it's absolutely amazing. It saves a tremendous amount of time for all our clients, uh, because because the, the only thing they have to do and to step in in the whole process, which is very critical in terms of uh, data review and authorization, is actually if something goes wrong. So really the whole, this powerful GTN automation makes the payroll process very easy. Uh, we call it like zero touch processing because at the moment the payroll providers will provide the file by uploading it in our platform. No matter in what format, uh, an automatic process is automatically triggered and the gross to net data is imported in our standard format and our clients are notified so they can review and authorize. And if there is any discrepancy, it will be absolutely presented on our uh, mapping validation reports, cross to net validation reports, and the clients will be able to unlock the file, resolve their problems and reinitiate the gross to net import again. Okay, fantastic. And what if it needs to go back to the payroll provider? Yeah, if it needs to go back to the payroll provider, it's, it's following the exact same zero touch processes. They will fix the gross to net or provide different version most probably. They will upload it and the whole process will be re-triggered once again. Okay, so it all happens within the platform, fantastic. So I, I don't know uh, across our 
um, colleagues here on the webinar today, but we had we got these fantastic payslip socks made for some of the trade shows today, and they say death to the spreadsheets. So I think in that example that you've given, <laughs> definitely uh, applied death to the Excel spreadsheets going by email attachment uh, or uploading into lots of different into tools. So that's fantastic and all available. And so then as the payroll process continues in, in your normal payroll operations process, then it starts feeding into accounting. Um, and what, you know, what, what opportunities are there for automating into the accounting? Because fundamentally, the finance guys are going to want to make sure it all balances. Absolutely. So that's another automation, this time on false payroll steps and another industry changing solution by Payslip. That's the self-serve general ledger. And uh, producing the general ledger reports is historically, I'm sure everyone will agree, a task that is outsourced to a third party. And it usually happens at the end of the payroll. However, with Payslip, our users have the power to generate the geo reports themselves. It happens with one click. Uh, they can do it as often as they need. And it can happen at any stage of the payroll process. The, the report will be produced in the minutes and will be available for them. So it's really a great advantage for our clients because if it gives them the insight and also the visibility of the geo reports so that they can run it even uh, before the final gross to net data is imported and they can check different uh, versions of the geos if they balance before the full, full gross to net absorption or at the end when we have the final version absorbed. So it's really simple and a great game changer, I would say. Okay, it must also save considerable in fees. I, I remember from, from the olden days talking to so many companies and they often had to pay a fee to each of the providers for the general ledger report uh, coming in. Um, and that could be several hundred for every monthly run for every company. So they're getting it at the end of the process. So they can't actually change anything at that point. They're paying a fee. If they want to get it rerun, they pay it again. And then it's in different formats. So they can actually save the time, the fee, and they can actually preempt uh, changes that are needed by uh, running the general ledger earlier. Is that, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And Mary, what do you what do you find when you're talking to the users now of the automated GTNs that we went through and also the automated general ledgers? Is is it making a difference? It's definitely a game changer, Padama. Um, first of all, because we know we have countries all over the world with the automated uh, GTNs, depending on the different time zones that the ICPs are working in and our clients are working in, that information goes through our uh, Zito automation and the results are there immediately. So it doesn't require um, any, any uh, attention to the timing or making sure that you have it in the particular, th uh, particular moment. They're getting the results. The validation reports tell them exactly what worked and what didn't work, and then also gives them guidelines of how to fix it. So here's, here's the steps you take. So they have everything at their fingertips to be able to fix the problem at a, at a particular moment. They, ha they don't have to depend on someone else. They own the, the entire process. And that really just streamlines everything. And then having the ability to unlock the file if they need to make an adjustment, that feature is now in the platform. So that is just giving them an additional tool to own that complete process. When we look at, when we talked about the GL, as, as Daniela um, highlighted, what's actually happened with that, that's a piece that really um, then saves tremendous amount of peace because the gross to net file is the single source of truth for that general ledger file. So we're using that general ledger, uh, the gross to net file to create the general ledger. So they know that the file is correct and that's what is we're using to build the file. We've heard from clients that sometimes the ICP is doing the, the GL file, but they're putting things in the wrong account. So we're spending hours, they're spending hours reconciling, did the salary get in the correct account or the bonus got moved to another account. So we're reducing all of that manual work of somebody having to do the, the report if it was done from the ICP. In some cases, our clients were creating these GL files themselves. So if you have one person in a country, it's a little bit easier than if you have 2,000 in a country. So they're saving, if they were doing it manually, they're saving hours, four to six hours. And any manual work requires, you know, second eye, double, two eye check on it. 
we then have our auditors more concerned about somebody manually creating those files. The file is automatically created. And with it being, as Daniela said, we can run at any point. Once you want that final file to go, it can be automatically sent to the finance system so that no one's even touching that file. So you can have a clear record of where it came from. So it really, really has saved a lot of time and it's really supported the finance teams, but it's also giving them audit ready and all of the different statutory and SOX audits, we have really clean records. So it's, it's a, it really is, both of those are really clear game changers that they know exactly what's happening to their data. Okay, so across those different automations and innovations from P payroll, the gross to net data flows, and then also the GLs, you're talking about time saving on each of them. There must be a, a reduced risk for human error. As you said, everything's been data stamped, so it's audit ready. Um, and so hopefully the global payroll people finally get to leave work on time and actually get back out and either enjoy the snow that we have in Ireland this week, very unusually, or, or something else during the summer periods. Um, and, but overall, the main message I'm getting is that all of the, you know, while we're automating and saving time, the fact that everything is tracked in the platform actually means that people have full visibility across the operational flow globally and in a standardized way. And it's interesting because, you know, way back when I had the first batty idea to build a platform to try and standardize global payroll management, the biggest goal was to help um, employers have a global a bigger picture of visibility, and not just operationally, but actually strategically as well. Because in, in my previous days, I couldn't see what was happening anywhere. And then you don't necessarily have the control and you can't make decisions. Um, and so the finance function, I always believe, like is very interested in reporting and analytics. And, and so we saw some innovation across the analytics and payslip as well this year. Daniela, maybe you could talk to us about some of the items that were re released this year on, on the analytics side of the house. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> absolutely agree with you, Fidelma. So we all know that the payroll managers and CFOs, they need payroll costs clarity. And they need bigger picture analysis. And from then on, they will review payroll expenses across entities, geographies, business units, everywhere to get the immediate uh, handle on the figures. And also they want to go deeper and deeper and look at country cost comparison reports uh, and to see what, uh, what story will the data will be telling them. And the, the basic global reporter already provides multinational employers with uh, essential and com comprehensive global payroll reporting. And we all know it happens by a touch of a button. It's always there 24 seven. But this year we have built uh, standout reports analytics into the global reporter to highlight the patterns and outline really the data and the differences. Uh, because this way, uh, everyone who is using the analytics can get instant um, feedback on the data they need on one very high level. And our analytics will empower the payroll professionals to transform the complex data that is usually presented in the reports into clear and actionable insights. It gives highlights on the trends. It gets a great presentation that can be used to, for accessible to all stakeholders, great usability and instant access to helpful analytics. Okay, fantastic. And have you seen it used much, Mary? Um, yes, definitely are seeing that used because that then the ability that we have, it automatically gives you the graph that you can put into a PowerPoint and share with upper management, highlight your teams. So it's definitely, um, Daniela, the product team, great job to be able to continue to enhance us on that, our roadmap to, um, with global reporting. So maybe I should just spend a few minutes on, on our Payslip Global Reporter, Fidelma. So it's our global um, reporter is self-service. So it gives you the ability at any moment in time to run over 80 reports. You have the, the ability to share that information from the global level all the way down to that micro level of an entity and get information on a, on a single entity and what's actually happening. The items that, you know, on the global side, we talked a lot about the recession. We talked, the title today was talking a little bit about the recession. We know the cost of payroll is huge. So having the ability to have the, at our fingertips, the, co the true cost of payroll that includes the employee's salary compensation, 
but then also the expenses that the employer has to pay for a particular um, in a particular entity. So it gives the um, the owner, uh, the business owner, the ability to have those provide information to finance about flexibility of the flex of, of the trends of what's happening with the analytics. It gives headcount information that helps the teams um, in our HR community to know exactly how many employees are, are, be, are in a particular location and get insight to um, employees that are on, have shadow payroll, who are employee of record, um, contractors in the system. That was another module that we added this year. So we have the ability um, to provide uh, have contractors with um, statements of the actual pay they have. And then, so as you mentioned, the full workforce, we're able to get drilled down to that information. And we can then show and highlight what payroll has and then help be a strategic part of the business as we manage that. With the automation, it gives us more time to be strategic players and look at areas to support the business. And in some of our clients, they've expanded their roles and are taking on new responsibilities because payslips made a difference in their particular company's footprint. Yeah, we saw a few nice promotions actually after Payslip was uh, yeah. <laughs> implemented. So I'll, I'll claim them, even though obviously the people were progressive to, to choose Payslip in the first place. That, that would be my bias. Um, and and in ter in, into reporting and analytics in 2023, Danielle, I know we'll talk more about 2023 and the recession topic in a few minutes. But like just while we're on the topic of reporting, what should we be looking forward to or what do we think we should be building out? More. Yeah. Well, before stressing on that fact, I really want to, to make a connection with what Mary said and all these real examples, because they're a great statement for all of us in Payslip, that whatever we're building is great solution for our clients. And when we talk about reporting, um, it's clear that we um, have such a robust capability for reporting because we have solved the global data problem. Uh, we have resolved the data standardization and consolidation problem. And actually, Payslip uh, global control platform stores all the data in a standardized manner from all the countries in this one system of record, which allows for comprehensive global reporting. Uh, as Mary said, we have huge range of reports and we're already helping clients unlock their data and get insights, take informative decisions. However, reporting and analytics is really uh, an evergreen investment in our product roadmap so that we constantly continue to innovate all the times in analytics and that it goes deeper and deeper in 2023 for us focusing uh, mostly on operational analytics, such for example, input versus output reports. And if I may just ask Mary to, to reconfirm that, I'm sure that she will share that this is a very big thing and very important for, for our clients. Yes, um, Daniela, this is, I think the number one topic for payroll professionals around the globe is to be able to get validations to compare the inputs that and instructions they gave to the in-country provider, that when that gross to net comes back, that we can have the validations that if you receive that bonus, it went to Daniela, it didn't go to Fidelma, and that the salary compensation is correct. And with all of the validations we have, we can even identify the changes that might have been made by the ICP adding new elements. Maybe there's a new tax that we didn't know, but we have a validation that will pull that out. The number of employees that are on the payroll, the validations that who, who's getting paid what, the comparison of what's happening and what the is um, produced from the ICP, that information needs to be provided to all of the auditors that we have around the world. So we have validations that our payroll is correct. Without the validations that have been built in Payslip, they had to do this manually. And when I say manually, yes, we know Excel is our friend in spreadsheets, as Fidelma says, the end of the death of spreadsheets. But if you have, you know, 20 plus entities and you're trying to do your B lookups in a tight crunch period to see that your payroll is correct and you can authorize it for payment, your hours are starting to tick away and the complexity of doing all those pieces becomes very stressful. So as Fidelma said, we actually are giving people time back to look at the information, take a deep breath, enjoy life a little bit too, and not working crazy hours to make sure that payroll is delivered on time. So one of the um, our clients um, what, with the validation and the um, automation of the information coming in, the time that um, 
they spent um, at Cloudera, one of our pay the payroll analysts there, and this is a quote from her, on the Payslip platform, automated feeds mean I no longer have to spend hours validating hundreds of bonuses and one-time payment inputs. I think every payroll professional knows the time they spend on that one. This is a big one. And she said, this can now be done in seconds. So I have much more time to review and analyze different trends and items that are happening. So this is a huge, as we talk about things that have happened with the platform, Daniela, and the work that's been done from the product, this is huge because payroll professionals are, are never overstaffed, right? They have, they're very, they have a lot of work to do, but this now gives them the power to be able to use these, these automation validations. And then also it gives them the ability to show um, their management what they're doing and also we always have to have our friendly auditors there to prove that our processes are good and what our checks and balances are in the system. So they have a solid platform and they're seen as leaders in the organization because that's really the, the, the role that they should be as strategic leaders in the organization. Okay, so it must, like obviously we know about saving time for each of the different tasks, but it must help shorten the actual payroll cycles and feed into the global payroll efficiency as well. Like I've been on two quite scary phone calls over the last week with companies not using PaySip, one of whom had invested a huge amount to try and standardize their controls and checks across 17, I think it is, different countries. And they had the most complicated version of spreadsheets and VLOOKUPs. Uh, like I was scared within 20 minutes of the conversation. I'm delighted to see that they were sharing it with me, but like I was really scared for the amount of like touch and involvement that had to happen. And they had the controls, but then A, they have to run them all manually. A person has to do them. Then they have to log them. And nothing then was really being timestamped to say, this is the check that was done at this time. This was the output for it. So even though they're running all the checks and they have like a sock narrative to say, these are the checks being done, they didn't end up having kind of an, audit report that would say this is what was done on this time by this person um, and so there's a huge amount of time going into it they still don't have the reporting output and then for the second call I had was pretty scary where there was a client and they are a potential client hopefully a client soon and their actual payroll cycle for December started on the 30th of November and the reason was because they had to send the data out to the payroll provider and the, between the payroll end payroll provider in country and the aggregator they were using there was 10 days built in for the data to go around and that's because those validations that have been automated and pace of are being done manually by the aggregator mm -hmm. so i assume that with all of this the a people are saving time and they have the control for the reporting and the auditing but they also actually can reduce that payroll cycle into three or four days I definitely, Fadama, I would agree with you. And on those few calls, um, when we talk about comparing files through VLOOKUPs, um, some of the things that I had con concerns about is somebody losing the formula in your nice template or picking the wrong file as our death to the spreadsheet. Are we really comparing uh, December to November or did we compare December to October if we're trying to just do the trend from uh, month to month? So, so definitely it does then give the team it gives them the ability, as I, I said, to be able to have the tools and and produce the payroll and know that it's accurate because at the end of the day, um, payroll is held to that standard to deliver accurate and compliant payroll. Yeah. And with all those VLOOKUPs and things, it, it doesn't, it, it puts a lot of stress at, at the key points when things are late. And we know in the world today that Everybody's on the schedule with the ICP and also the client and, you know, things slip with somebody maybe being out sick um, or even as we saw with COVID, there was business continuity changes where somebody had to step in. So having all of this, the automation by validations, the tools, the standardization, all of the items on the GL that that Danielle has talked about, the work on the on the zero touch really helps the client to be able to have a standard process. And so if people are out in LATAM, somebody in Europe can step in and, and do yeah. the job for them. Yeah, so the platform provides the business continuity. It also provides good tooling. So the stress of the process doesn't have to be stress on the people uh, because right. they can do it the same way. I might just take a pause here because I know we're on the half hour for another poll. Uh, so maybe Michelle, if you want to run one of those, we might see what our um, 
webinar participants think. So that the uh, question is, uh, what new challenge do you expect to face with payroll in 2023? And we've three options, demand for cost management related to payroll reporting, probably any payroll I imagine, managing global payroll and local vendors, or managing payroll for a dispersed remote or extended workforce. I'm sure we can all come up with about 20, lots of 20,000 challenges that we're all facing in 2023. But there's a few just to give us a little flavor of that. So if people can choose what they have, we, we give it 30 seconds. So Fidelma, I, I know like number one, I know some, um, some of our clients are looking at their um, workforce, right? So demand for cost management related to payroll reporting. So they're, they're spending some time with up, getting questions from upper management on the cost, the number of employees, because sometimes we have to make challenging decisions um, with business in the current model. Things will come back and they'll need that information. So when they want to hire in a location, they'll know exactly what the cost of doing business is. So yeah. I, I definitely um, see that as one of the items that I think our attendees today will be looking at or yeah. selecting. Yeah. Okay, and we can see now it's filling up. So we've eaten mm -hmm. 7, 10, 18. We've about half the people have answered it. And we on the panel don't actually contribute. So I'll take off our numbers. We'll just give it a few more seconds to go. Um, it's interesting they brought up the remote. Um, we we mm -hmm. know uh, where are our employees in a, in a remote or extended workforce that we have um, after the 2020, so I, I do would agree with that one is it is one of the items too that will be facing challenges and compliance yeah. and payroll work. Okay, so I don't see the numbers have changed in the last oh. second, so I might just call it now we see. So we have uh, by by one, we have a, a winner on number eight, the last one managing payroll for dispersed remote or extended. So you're absolutely correct, Mary, that's um, striking a chord across lots of people. Um, I think also there's a strong recognition, as I mentioned at the top of the call, that the workforce isn't purely employees. It also has employees of record. It has contractors. And like historically, it, like contractors didn't always fall into the payroll department, but they're beginning to see as uh, be seen as an alternative resource or uh, just in a different way of, of their budget. So now they want to compare them. So I could really see how that's reporting item. Managing global payroll and local vendors, well, that will always be uh, um, a piece of work. And then demand for cost management related to payroll, that says three of 18. So that's a new challenge, interestingly. Um, okay, well, thank you very much for that. We'll keep that front and centre. And I suppose moving on to 2023, you know, what, what do we see happening? We see a lot of the language has kind of changed, I think, this year. And so, like, I'm I'm pretty obsessed about this global local reference always in global payroll. So, um, and, and like payroll is always local. It's always um, different in every different countries. Every country will make their own rules and taxation and their own requirements in terms of filing. Um, and so what I see across global payroll management operations is that over the years, people have said, you know, how do you manage global payroll? And the answer has been, how do they manage their vendors or how they choose a single vendor? And it kind of goes into this model conversation that we see with, with Gartner or the analysts. And I've seen that language kind of change over the last two years. When you ask somebody now, how do you manage your global payroll operations? They're kind of dividing it into pillars. So they might say, well, here's our, our strategy is that we, we know we need expertise. Full stop. That's a given. It's a fact of life. The question is, do we want the expertise to be internal or external? Um, and then, then the question is, then what would be the process for managing payroll across all of the different worlds? And then how do we manage that process? Is it through loads of SharePoint and VLOOKUPs? Or are we looking at some software that can automate the workflow and the data flows and the validations? And in the end, what I see in all the conversations, and we'll, we'll hear from our uh, people in a minute, is that they usually most of the companies end up dividing their countries into pillar pillars. So they might have some super large countries and, and they bucket them by sizes. Um, and because payroll is still local, they still have to go and find a way to, to manage them across. For super large companies, they might have ADP Global View for like really large countries if they want to outsource it versus using an internal team with SAP. And then outside, they end up having some range of different providers for the different countries. Um, 
And so what, what do you think, Mary, when you see like companies approaching the question of how will I manage global payroll into the future? What do I need to be ready for? What, what are they generally looking for as global payroll managers? Um, as global payroll managers, first of all, they're they're looking for providers that can make sure that they're compliant and deliver the payroll on time. Those are the those are the two kind of driven factors that affect their job um, real time, and that's what the organization's expecting from them. So as they go out to look, they're they're looking for somebody that's going to provide customer service in the in the role, right? It's if there's questions and pieces that they need somebody locally that has the expertise to help them with the complex um, compensation components you have. If you have equity, then you want somebody that can help that help you with that equity understanding and they're going to make sure it's done correctly. It could be shadow payroll, expats, there could be secondments that are, are happening. All of that is they're looking for providers that can understand their compensation components and then making sure that it's compliant with with delivery on time with support with support when they need support right they want to be able to have the tools to do their job and payslip provides that but we also want to be able to get the information and reporting so that we can actually benchmark their services right so we want to make sure that the services that we're getting from our provider that we're benchmarking and we're having discussions about that it doesn't do anyone any good if we're not um, talking about that everything's um, turned in late, right? We're always having to do rework on the payroll. Our validation reports are showing that you're forgetting bonuses every every pay, every second payroll. So those are the things that we want to talk and work with the vendor. And when we when you talked about small versus large, we really have to find the provider that's going to work because if I have ten people in a country, that's a different model than having five thousand in Brazil, right? So I need to make sure that I have the support that I need for the complexity of my uh, co particular company, and then also the complexity of that particular uh, country. And the business that you're in has a driving factor too. If we have a lot of um, retail or time, um, people that are being paid by the hour, we have to be able to be able to have somebody that can service that and do the calculations for after hours and those pieces. Okay. So it is, um, it is finding that model and I don't want to really say model. I think it's more an operation. We hear the word we hear the word model, but I think it's an operation selection of who is going to fit best in your organization. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And Daniela, Mary's mentioning there about like a lot of growth and complexity of pay and comp elements. And like a year ago, we were still talking about the talent war and how companies were innovating with comp and Ben in order to make sure they were attractive to the talent that they wanted, that they were able to scale up into new countries quickly, and that also they um, could have direct access to the expertise so that they could actually designate what comp and Ben elements they wanted to innovate with and how they were um, to be treated in the local country from a taxation perspective. How has that impacted on, on the product? Have you seen a growth in the type of comp and bed elements and, 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 and how does that pose a challenge for the standardization that everybody chose on the, on the poll earlier? Indeed, yes. Uh, we have seen that uh, through the different requests that are coming from our clients and from client success team. A lot of interesting uh, ideas were implemented on the product. So we moved forward with different localization of the names per client. We have a number of interesting um, enhancements coming as well related to that, which are related to uh, recurring pay elements as well and uh, helping on the operational side as well, different uh, opportunities for uh, just removing an element which is no longer needed in the payroll, no longer needed in the reports. And of course, uh, because we have provided one great report this year to provide uh, a full detail of all the pay and taxes elements that are set up on the company, uh, on the platform across all the companies that that is giving great help for our clients in terms of standardization when they start looking at it. It is also very useful when they start reviewing and uh, having the desire to either assign one element to a different subcategory within the main category or, or just deal with different uh, options with this element. So a lot of uh, definitely in the product side, we have noticed the impact. Okay. Dan oh, Daniela, sorry, on, that re on that report, I <clears throat> wanted to also highlight that our clients are using that report for the standardization, but they're also looking at that because it has the ability to display the GL account. 
and they've been able to identify that they didn't have standardization across all of their countries. So it's been a, a huge win um, for, for using that tool and that report for the clients. Okay, yeah. so they have to have streamlined the GL codes independent mm -hmm. of the payroll. Okay, fantastic. And so it was while we're back to reporting, just uh, like as I mentioned a few times a year, over a year ago, everybody saw my talent war. Now people are talking about recession. There's still a shortage of in the labour market of lots of key skills. So there's like this really interesting, complex external environment happening. Um, but if I'm in a company, a multinational employer, I'm running payroll in different countries. I need to be able to deal with both. So like we're back to our reporting question again. So how have you seen, um, I suppose, Mary, like from the customer side of things, what are they saying that they are doing with the reporting or with the platform that will help them respond to the business in terms of the recessionary concerns that are out there? So there's a, a first of all, there's a one big one is that we have the ability to use FX uh, exchange rates that you think might be happening. So you can do trends with that. So they can look in certain areas where the exchange rate is, is rapidly changing, going up or down, what's the impact to the organization. But they're also running the reports for the entire year and the trends. And they're providing that information to financial analysts so they can look at what, what do they expect for the coming year if we're reducing headcount based on these this many people, this is the cost. Um, we know the cost of, um, Inflation, do, are they going to do pay increases? What does that impact look like? So the financial analyst can kind of model that out for the business and help support what, what is actually happening. And then as they're, as they're doing downsizing, right, providing that report, because even when you're doing some downsizing of employees, there is a cost um, with the packages that are given to the employees. So they'll be able to recognize exactly what the cost of, if you let 10 people go, what was that co the true cost of that? And in some, in some companies that is recorded in finance differently, so they may need to go to a special account code that will be, you can make that change in the platform and they'll be able to get reporting exactly what happens with those codes. And the other thing that, that's happening is because of these uh, different downsizing, we have different payment times that it could last for three months and you have the ability to get that information of what's happening with the trend and then measure measure as things are going with the analytics, um, what's really happening with your payroll expenses and monitoring so it. It keeps, it keeps coming back to Danny's point about sorting the data model. So yeah. I might, I might jump to you, Daniela, because you are the, the representing the visionary side of Payslip on the call in terms of what's coming into the future. Maybe you can talk to us about what's on the roadmap next year that might also help our clients facing into a recessionary environment. Yes, sure. So um, just before uh, we talk a little bit about the slide, I, I just want to say that basically roadmap has always been determined in a way that takes into consideration global payroll critical needs. We're always looking at efficiency, automations, execution excellence, and not only. We're always taking into account the external environment as well and the economic climate uh, as it definitely matters. So for the moment, both you and Mary have already talked about some of the challenges that global businesses are experiencing now with the recession. And I just want to stress on that fact once again that Payslip can support our clients through that process with all the unique technology solutions that we currently provide that uh, you and Mary has also mentioned and that in 2023 we will make sure that we'll further enhance them. Our focus is definitely on helping multinational employers by giving them the tools to navigate via the recession, to manage payroll operations and to stay compliant and, and audit ready. So on the slide here, like uh, we, if we can uh, talk briefly about navigating, uh, navigating a recession like to navigate through the recession uh, like really you need a total workforce workforce and cost visibility you need better processes in place and you need efficiency uh, and no matter if uh, what in, in terms of economic cycle if it's a peak or recession because the payroll process is always very critical it has to be efficient and to be efficient we always need global reporting and visibility we need automated processes delivery and we need flexibility in the payroll process management and speed and agility. So uh, we already provide all that, but we'll definitely 
further develop in, in these areas, uh, like in terms of glo global reporting, as we said, we'll uh, further enhance the analytics. Uh, we have a lot of ideas there. We also um, have new reports in terms of operational analytics, such as input versus output. Uh, in terms of automation, definitely it's our mission to continue the automation journey, uh, the automated process delivery versus manual for, for our clients. And in terms of flexibility, it's always important to accommodate clients' processes and clients' needs. Yeah. Yeah, really good points there. That's very interesting. The point about the economic cycle, it's absolutely true. Like when everybody was in high growth mode up to a year and a half ago, it was always about scale up control. How do I get into the new country? How do I get the new provider live? How do I do this? Like tomorrow, I found the great talent. I can't make them go. I, I can't let them go. I have to make sure I get them. And now actually you have a different driver for scaling up sometimes because they might say, well, we have a cost ceiling, but we don't have an FTE ceiling. So if we move maybe more eastwards, we might actually get two people for the cost of one in, in Ireland or over in San Francisco or in a different country. So we can see again a little bit of the, not the offshoring, but they might have had a shared service center in Hungary or the Czech Republic, and now they're boosting some of the jobs there. And then they're kind of right-sizing in other countries. So actually they might have to still scale up while at the same time downsizing in some other countries. Yeah, so the reporting feeds into that. The system has to be standardized across the different countries. The people now have to know how to work. And then they have to, the, the process has to be flexible and the vendors to be able to kind of ramp it up as well. So really interesting about how you need both the ramp up and the reduction across the different, different parts of the cycle. Mary, anything else that you think might be needed or what are your thoughts on, on that in terms of navigating the recession? I think all of the items that we talked about is what we really have to navigate through. And then also just use the reporting um, to share as we talked about that. So you have the ability to see what's happening and understanding as if you downsized in a, on a payroll team, if you have the tools that we've already talked about, the standardization, the automation and those pieces, if you lose a team member, you're going to have a solid platform if you have the technology and the operation model, the operation set up for your organization so that you quickly be able to cross train um, people and have them take on new countries. OK, fantastic. OK, and so maybe we move on with the product uh, roadmap. We're also focusing on my favorite word, the messiness of payroll, like it's never going to be clear cut. There's always going to be lots of messiness across the different countries. Talk to us, Daniela, about what we what we look forward to seeing next year. Yeah, sure. So great uh, statements here on the slide. So accurate data flows, validations and controls and vendor management. Absolutely. As we already said, we are very focused on all the automations uh, because with one unified data and process model, all the data is integrated in the platform and all the automated validations to improve the quality. They'll consolidate the data across HCM, ICP, and then the reports going to the accounting function. So the data flows are very important. And once they're determined and clients process, we can easily automate uh, any one of them and automation goes along with validation. So that's why validations and controls are next on the slide. Uh, so when we talk about automations, it's very important to, to mention two of our greatest automation as well that we have delivered in 2022. Uh, but definitely we're investing more uh, time and resources to further enhance to, to higher levels. So this is our multi-input payroll integrator and our multi-output payroll integrator. So both are great tools. Uh, and excellent integrations options that are automating from one side the multi input payroll integrator, the pre payroll data import. It helps us transfer the data from the original files, regardless of the format, reducing the risk of human error. Of course, it goes along with validations. The same with the multi output payroll integrator, it is automatic generation of the pre-payroll data output file matching to the local country vendor format requirements. And again, saving time reduces cost and human error and uh, as well goes along with validations and controls. So the error detection and validations are now available throughout the, the full payroll cycle on all these steps that we mentioned, pre-payroll, payroll, and post-payroll, on um, HCM integrations, MIPI, gross to net zero, touch GL. However, in 2023, we'll definitely are working towards adding more. 
uh, eliminating the critical manual, critical manual tasks and avoiding uh, these human touches and reducing the risk for our clients. And in terms of vendor management, like Mary has already spoke about the importance of that uh, and choosing the vendors. And indeed on Payslip, uh, our clients have this increased visibility of their ICP delivery. Um, the clients are able to review and to evaluate the vendor's performance with our audit workflow reports, with our time and uh, date stamp uh, changes that are made in the system. So it's just another great tool that we have and we'll keep on further enhancing. Okay, and I know we have a few questions uh, in the chat, so we'll come to those in a minute. We might just go to the last topic for next year, which, of course, just like when you're buying a house, it's all about location, location, location. <laughs> in payroll, we always have to come back to compliance, compliance, but then we have all these trends. We've probably touched on some of these, but maybe just give us a quick overview of what we hope to see enhanced and what we're doubling down on a payslip R&D in, in investment next year and, and compliance and environmental trend relations. Daniela. Yeah, so these are always top prospects, priorities, uh, like being compliant, being audit ready. And um, I might give the word to Mary because I'm sure that she will agree with that. No, I, I, I definitely, something. yeah, I definitely agree that, um, that we're spending, um, and the product enhancements for next year that we've talked about with Daniela. And it's important to note that um, the clients are providing feedback to, uh, to the teams and client success, and we're getting that over to the product managers. Having the inputs versus outputs is a big, big win for the audit readiness and, the, and actually the vendor management to make sure the vendors are delivering that was on the other slide. We're also looking at payment options, so payment solution options that Daniela and team are looking at and have plans to release some information in 2023, which is huge because once again, it, it takes away that heavy lifting of these files and who has to go out and, and put a report someplace for it to be picked up by the banking system and that. So you'll we'll see some more information on that. And then, of course, as we move forward, all the pieces of the FX rates we talked about with the reporting piece and, and continue to have that reporting um, piece. Uh, we have a lot of, um, we have, we've done a lot with reporting, Danielle, I think you would agree, um, in the last year, and we'll be continuing to do that next year. But that that's really the item, as we talked about, is having the tools of the standardization and the footprint for the, the platform that the technology provides, provides us the ability to provide that to our clients. Absolutely. Okay, big year next year. So we'll have lots of big and smaller reveals during the year. So hold, <laughs> hold, 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 the, hold the spot in your diary, folks. I think we're going to have to have a have a big audience with lots of popcorn for our product release every single month. So I might, thank you very much, Mary and Daniela, for giving us all that details and sharing it with us. And um, you, you, Michelle, over to you on the on the questions. Yes, we've actually had some quite a number of questions to get through now, so we'll do our best, but we will reach out to those who that we don't get to um, just in case we run out of time here today. So our first question that came in, I'll start with that is, uh, and it's going back to kind of this is earlier in the session for inputs, you mentioned um, that these have been automated instead of using the flexi form, or does it mean that all inputs are now into PACIP rather than files sent to the ICP? or as an input via the ICP portal. Um, is that clear enough to answer? I think the question is asking, where is the data going to get yeah. into the what's, what's the flow? Mary, do you want to yeah. take this? Uh, I'm sure I'll take that. So first of all, the flow of data comes from multiple sources. It could come from your HCM system or a report. It could come from your benefit system. Whatever different pieces are, we're going to get that into our uh, system. So it'll be on the what we call our pay run file. And once all of that information is there, you have the review of that information. And we use um, the input, our MIPI, but that's the way that we can bring it in from other sources. So maybe it's commissions mm -hmm. that come from a commission file. We'll be able to put that into the pay run file. So we'll put all that information that you have from your multiple sources. You you always have the ability to do a manual entry before you say it's approved. We don't recommend manual, but if something does happen, we know things happen in payroll. Once you approve that uh, payroll, then the flexi forms will be populated into the form that each of the individual countries require. 
So I might have five for the UK, but I could have, you know, 15 for uh, Brazil, depending on what, what's there. And we know on those flexi forms, if you've used them, they have different requirements. So on the time in attendance or the leave piece, you're putting the start and end dates. And is it half a day or is it a full day and all the different leave types uh, for some countries that you need to do that tracking. So you'll, you'll have everything done for you that you would be doing manually for okay. the flexi form. Thank you, Mary. Um, during that, this one might be back to you again, Mary. It's an implementation question. During implementation, are you able to standardize wage codes um, in use at Payslip on the Payslip side, even if they differ on an ICP level to simplify the inputs and the reporting for global mobility cases? Um, so on, you do element classification. So we have the, we ask for the English global name we ask for the in-country name. So we would have, if you're in Germany, would have the equivalent to um, salary or bonus in, in German. You have the ability, if you have wage codes, standardized wage codes, let's say I always use 100 for salary. We also have a place for that in our element classifications that you'll see that. And then you're classifying the element if it's you know an, an earning, a deduction, an employer cost. But we have a subcategory, which, I, which is fantastic. And this helps you put um, the subcategories for items together. Let's say, for example, you want to, you have a lot of different types of bonuses, but you want to highlight which ones are the sign-on bonuses. So you can put a subcategory of sign-on bonuses. For the global mobility question, you can build a, you can build a subcategory that says it's for global mobility or expat expense. And then when you're running a report, you can get, you can run the report just by that subcategory and you'll get the, uh, all of the components that are are categorized to expat expense or global mobility expense in that case of the question. And then you'll have that information and you can run that for a single entity, but you can run it globally. So you can see what the impact of that would be running that globally and then bringing it to the exchange rate that, that you need. So it might be USD depending on if, you, if you're US headquartered, but or it could be the Euro, it could be the pound, it could even be the yen in Japan if you needed that. So you have that ability. And we know with this question, expats generally cost us almost three times the annual salary. So this is a good way to kind of highlight the cost of expenses as we're looking in as, as recessionary items that we've been talking about. Okay, excellent. A strong yes there. Okay, uh, one for you, Fadema. Are there any ICPs that you do not work with? No, not from our policy perspective. So in Payslip, we see that we've hundreds of payroll providers adopted on the platform, they come by introduction from our customers. Uh, we see three types of ICPs. So you have an ICP that could be part of the um, <clears throat> big four or tier, the top six payroll providers like the Deloitte's, the PwC's, the EY's, BDO's. We, we have loads of them uh, across many different countries. So there's no problem with them on the platform. It's working very well. Our clients like them because they have depth of expertise. Um, then there are also in-country providers that are unique to that country, so that's fine. They could be very small or quite large in those countries, there's no problem with those. And then we have um, payroll providers who are members of like aggregator services. So we've seen a range of the ADP Streamline partners coming onto the platform. Um, also a lot of the TMF companies that kind of fall more into that and the SD works. The ones I would expect to have um, the tricky with this would be like some of the aggregators that run effectively kind of closed door services. So like the, the cloud pair, the Amidas, where you're not allowed to talk directly to the payroll provider. They don't want anybody talking to them. So it's a bit, you know, a bit like going to a Mac drive. You have to go up one side and put in your ticket and you get it out the other side. You don't see what's happening in the middle. They might not like that analogy, but that's how I think of it in my head. So I don't see those guys are probably going to want to work with us because they claim their platform does some things, but really their platform just delivers their service. And we haven't had their customers coming to us so far. We do have customers coming off their platform and moving to the other accountancy and ICP formats. Um, and across any of the ICPs that have come into us, or even some of the internal systems, we've had 100% adoption. So no, we, we have a very good collaborative model. We have a very good way of building trust and getting the payroll providers adopted on the system. And then usually the payroll providers come back with amazing feedback that they're happier 
delivering to the customers who pace it because they get the right data, they get it on time, and it's always in a format that they can ingest directly into their engine. And it actually elevates their service delivery to be equal to all the other providers across the world. Okay, super. And I'm just going to squeeze in one more question because it's it's here and uh, I don't want to, to miss it because it's a good one. Do I understand that the GL file outputs can also be automated for upload to a financial system, not just generated from Payslip? And Danny, I might get this one to you. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Absolutely. I think Mary has already mentioned it earlier during the conversation. <laughs> uh, different clients, like different needs during onboarding and implementation as soon as we identify what are their processes and their preferred actions during the process and steps we will be working in that direction so it's just another automation for us and for the client during their process great thanks for clarifying yeah, just to, just to highlight right now we have a, a client that um, is sending everything through an sftp site as soon as the uh, file is done and we, they're in 30 plus uh, different entities across the world so it's really streamline them and that's actually helped them with their SOX compliance and some of the steps that they had to do. They were, the management was thrilled to have that, be able to have that uh, be going that way. Okay, we might need to wrap it there. I think we've gone two minutes mm -hmm. over. So my apologies to people for their diaries, a uh, little tiny overlap there. Thank you very much. Thanks to Daniela and Mary for joining me today for this conversation and thanks to Michelle for organizing it and we appreciate there's been a great range of people across countries across verticals and across the water over the states as well as here in Europe so thank you very much for joining with us today if you have any queries or questions uh, please do send them directly into us and we'd be delighted to talk to you directly and have a great evening and have a great end of year and we will all be ready for whatever hits us next year <laughs> happy Christmas Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.